All right. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Joe, for inviting me over. I'm so excited to talk to this group. Um, thank you for joining the meetup uh, and spending your Wednesday evening uh, with this really fun crowd. Uh, my name is Alyssa Vishnik. I'm the CEO at Ylabs, uh, which is an AI observability company. And today I'd like to present an open source project that I believe feels a huge current gap in uh, the way we do data pipelines. And like I said, please um, jump in, ask questions. Happy to make it a super interactive discussion. Um, maybe a little bit about me. Um, this is a picture of me in Norway. I'm sitting on the rock that is hanging 1000 meters above the ground. It sums up uh, a lot of my personality. Uh, I started my career at Amazon, uh, working on the main, main retail websites, uh, figuring out how to do continuous integration, continuous deployment for the Amazon retail website. I think everybody knows how to do that now, but believe it or not, in 2008, that was not a thing. Uh, and then I joined uh, one of the first R&D groups uh, focused on deploying machine learning solutions to production in various businesses internal to Amazon. Uh, it was almost as thrilling as sitting on that rock uh, because I was uh, in, in the group that mostly consisted of machine learning scientists who came from academia, could develop amazing methods, but none of us ever built machine learning systems at the Amazon scale or shipped it to production. So because of my DevOps background, I carried a pager quite a bit and then uh, really developed a taste for debugging uh, data pipelines and ML models. Um, I really fell in love with the tools and the path of uh, creating reliability uh, for data and machine learning systems. Uh, I joined the Allen Institute for AI, uh, spent some time figuring out what is ML reliability and data reliability uh, and how can we solve the problems in that space. And uh, a lot of things fell together. And today uh, I am a very lucky individual who gets to work with some of the most incredible people I have ever worked with in my career. Uh, a lot of them are actually here. Uh, that's how dedicated they are to, <laughs> to reliable AI practices. So we have Drew, Bernice and Chris and Maria and Sam and Andy. Um, they will probably tune in and pitch in as, as we talk about uh, some of the stuff we've both built uh, at Y Labs and built for the open source community. Um, also, I uh, briefly mentioned I, I'm an MC and organizer of a community called Robust and Responsible AI. Uh, it's a group of over a thousand individuals who build and deploy models at enterprises. And um, if you find the topic of ML reliability and robustness thrilling and exciting, uh, so exciting that you're willing to spend your evenings listening to uh, people in the space, I will. Um, yeah, follow me on Twitter, follow the R squared on Twitter to see some of the events that we're running. Uh, and if you're excited about any of the topics, reliable AI, reliable data pipelines, uh, shoot me an email, always love talking to practitioners. All right, uh, so what are we gonna do today? Uh, really quick agenda, just to keep us focused. Uh, we're gonna talk about data pipelines, talk about what's missing. Uh, I guess a spoiler alert right here is, uh, I believe one of the biggest things missing in the, the data pipelines is an ability to log things. Uh, we'll talk about why that's critical. Why do we want to log? What do we want to log? I'll present some ideas on how to design a logging solution for data. Uh, and present an open source library that we've developed uh, at Wild Labs, talk about how it integrates with some common uh, data tools. And uh, as we go, please jump in, ask questions. I have a few uh, team members here who probably jump in and share some of their own experience uh, with not having logging capabilities and how, uh, how we've been solving it at Wild Labs. All right, I hear a violin, I think. That would be that would be a nice background music, very relaxing. All right, so let's talk about data pipelines. Uh, and you know, data pipelines power decisions. Uh, machine learning models are like uh, crazy, really fast decision makers. 
that uh, take in data and output decisions. And uh, these machine learning models ultimately power customer experiences. Uh, so they do tend to fail in hilarious and unfortunate ways. Uh, an example of a you know classic ML failure that is probably caused by either bad data or drift uh, is captured here. Uh, Andreas here got recommended a pepper as a substitute for roses by the Whole Foods algorithm. It's a very harmless failure, but a frustrating customer experience. I didn't want to put really sad examples like getting credit card denied for uh, for various reasons. You know, this is a harmful example, but just imagine what it takes to debug something like this to figure out what happened uh, along the data pipeline that would cause uh, such an experience. Uh, I've heard that debugging such undesirable model behavior is so frustrating. It makes you feel like you're trapped in a Kafka novel. Uh, those who, who are into literature probably can, can relate. Uh, I heard that Kafka is not, uh, Kafka, the, the, the thing that's more familiar to data engineers is not quite as bad, but also probably comparable. I'm gonna try to make jokes on a Wednesday night. Uh, I can see Bernice smiling, so that makes me feel good. Uh, so since 2019, I've been uh, talking to a bunch of data teams and trying to understand how do things fail. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time experiencing how data things fail at Amazon, and I really wanted to get a fuller picture of uh, ways data pipelines and ML pipelines fail. Uh, so I would go out, talk to practitioners, ask my favorite question, uh, is, um, ask them my favorite question, which is tell me a story of a recent failure that you dealt with in your data pipeline or in your ML pipeline. And surprisingly, every single one of those people that I asked had a failure story and they told it very passionately. That's my favorite part about talking to practitioners. So what you're seeing here is, believe it or not, a a list of uh, just a tiny sample actually of problems and stories that I collected over time. Uh, if you're a software engineer in the audience, you're likely noticing some really basic CICD issues uh, or the lack of CICD. Uh, if you're operating a model in production, you're probably nodding right now. Although if you're operating a model in production and you have not encountered any of these failures, I'd love to talk to you because you either have an amazing uh, data pipeline and ML platform, or maybe you're just not seeing those problems because you're flying blind. Uh, and either way, would love to talk and learn about your experiences here. And if anybody wants to share now, uh, quick rant session on how their data pipelines have failed recently. Would love to take seconds to give that opportunity. Maybe somebody has a story. Not everybody at once. I'll go. I'll go. So we have a, a process that uh, it kicks off all the, the um, in, the, in the pipeline we have dependencies obviously, but look for those dependencies to be completed within a certain window. And so, um, one of the failures we had this, this last week was that it failed and uh, the ops team, they're not up at 3 a.m. for some reason. So it, it goes on, then they, when they wake up and get online, they kick it off, but it doesn't kick off the next events because that window has already passed. And so every event thereafter, you have to restart manually and it delays, delayed the data getting to the business for quite some time. Wow. Ouch, that's painful indeed. How are you tackling this, Mark? Uh, we're trying to set up notifications that will actually come directly to our cell phones. Um, we're trying to do more error logging because we actually still don't know why the Oracle database didn't accept the query. It, it, it's run, it ran the day after just fine. It ran the day before just fine. So we need to start logging why Oracle doesn't like that query sometimes, but we don't know right now. Yeah the exciting world of uh, debugging data pipelines. Thank you for sharing, Mark. And hi, who's who's the little cute baby there? Oh, she's a data engineer in training. <laughs> What's her name? Uh, her name is, is Rosie. Rosie, hi, Rosie. I have a little baby downstairs. Her name is Athena. I think they might be similar age. My, my daughter is a little over six months old. Yep, she's four months. Yeah. All right, Rosie, you're going to be a data engineer uh, and a fantastic one who never experiences failures because we'll talk all about resolving them here. Uh, sweet, anybody else has a story to share? Yeah, I can go. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, this is a really good list. Uh, I think uh, the ones that we experience are mostly around the uh, surge in missing values, surge in duplicates. Um, um, I think uh, a lot of the data we process it feeds into ML models, but also um, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, we process uh, a really high uh, large scale data, which goes into billing and invoicing. So, uh, so a lot of our, our you know, uh, developers, game developers get paid um, uh, for their spend on our ad networks or you know, in-app purchasing, things like that, based on that, uh, the, the data we, our pipelines produce. So, so a lot of times they're you know, late arriving events, uh, things like that, where we have like uh, uh, pipelines running on a lag uh, to make sure we capture everything. And, and uh, we do have uh, fairly sophisticated things to, to, to check and capture some of these, but you know, it's, it's always something new that, that you know, breaks something, <laughs> so. This is, uh, this resonates a lot. I've heard uh, lots of horror stories about duplicates and missing values. Would love to get your thoughts on on the way uh, we've been tackling it. And I think Unity's data volumes are something very, very exciting for, for, for my uh, brain, at least I love big data. All right, well, we'll... Uh, Move on, but jump in with your story if if you didn't have a chance. Okay, so uh, I think this this part we already we already kind of uh, captured in a way. Uh, majority of the problems that at least data pipelines and and the data pipelines that power ML pipelines experience are problems that come from data. Uh, and as uh, Mark shared and and I think uh, Sid shared to an extent. Uh, these these failures are really hard to identify, capture, figure out where they came from, uh, because we don't have a concept of logging, monitoring, validating at least well-established practices around that. Similarly to how we do this in traditional DevOps, uh, and I think this is partly because uh, the ML ops practice is very new. We're still figuring out how to do this, and I think if we all put our brains together, uh, we probably will solve it in the next year or two. Uh, but it does require lots of collaboration, which is why I'm excited to tell you about an idea that uh, we've been de developing at Y Labs and uh, get your feedback. Uh, so uh, here again, uh, not a surprise to anybody. One of the biggest challenges uh, with figuring out where issues and data come from comes from the fact that uh, the data pipelines and you know, think of a machine learning model just as, as another data transformation step. They're crunching a lot of data terabytes of data potentially, thanks to all of the awesome big data tools that we have. Um, the ability to crunch this much data is both a blessing and a curse. Um, if we look at the four steps that are here, and this is just a very, very simplified view of what a machine learning pipeline would look like. Uh, every one of these steps crunches data, transforms massive amounts of data. Every one of these steps could introduce a data bug or will completely be derailed by a data bug, just like said, brought up missing values, duplicates, very basic things. Uh, potentially either your models are going to be derailed or the systems that are making decisions based on uh, this data will be derailed. And I think one of the hardest questions here, or one of the hardest things here is uh, what information do you need to capture from uh, this really high volume data throughput stack uh, in order to identify when things go wrong and answer some basic questions. Uh, and I think while these questions mathematically are super, super easy to answer, uh, for a typical data engineering pipeline uh, or data pipeline, they could be really, really com complicated to, to answer. And Drew and I, uh, we're brainstorming the other day about you know answering the most simple question that an ML ML scientist or an ML engineer wonders ponders about, uh, which is what is the distribution of my feature in any given point. And uh, Drew had a really passionate response, which I, I hope he can share here of how how difficult would it be to answer that simple question in kind of a typical setup. Drew, want to hop in to share? I love your story. Sure. Um, so just a little bit of background. I'm Drew. I have a 
background in uh, data pipeline engineering. And um, well, one of the uh, war stories that has happened in multiple times in my career is uh, somebody just needs to look at data distribution of some data over time. And if it was in an easy to query data store, then no problem. But no, it's in a data lake that somebody designed five years ago. They can only be read with the Spark job. And uh, we want to um, put it into a dashboard. OK, so we start you know, engineering. OK, how are we going to make this pipeline? So we're going to write to S3. Do I write to a Delta Lake? Well, then I gotta make sure I got my compactions and my periodic vacuuming. If, or it, maybe that's not an option, I'm doing S3 snapshots, but then I'm thinking about S3 lifecycle policies. So I'm not keeping these snapshots around forever. And that's something that's gotta be able to query it. So maybe we use Amazon Athena and we grant access to our S3 bucket. And then maybe we're gonna use this BI tool. So we gotta make sure that can access Athena. We gotta make sure that I am access for that BI user in production is okay. And by the time we like build this whole thing, just to look at our data distribution over time, we're like, wow, we just spent weeks to answer one question for this one VP who wanted to look at these numbers. Um, is there a different way we could do that? Uh, and because I, that just feels like total overkill uh, for that amount of engineering, but it might be a really large data set. It could be a hundred terabytes. So I don't want to send it. I don't want to like copy it to a data warehouse because then I have to figure out, well, which vendor are we going to use and how much is that going to cost? It's probably going to be something astronomical. Um, I, I, you know, uh, and I, I don't want to be thinking about anonymization either because um, it, it requires too much brain space. Uh, you, you think about like anonymizing uh, location data. Well, that can very easily be de-anonymized just by comparing to public data sets. And there's all sorts of um, public uh, blogs about people taking medical records where everything was cryptographically hashed and salted and all that goodness. But then somebody was able to correlate it with public data sets and figure out, okay, well, these zip codes are actually these hashes and start kind of rewinding all this anonymization work. So I like, I don't really trust anonymization. I don't want sampling to get my data volume small because I'm, I'm gonna miss out on pieces of the data. So how can I get an overall view of my data without all this data pipelining work and um, all these uh, data pipelining problems and S3 life cycles and IAM roles, like I, I would, and I didn't realize it until um, I saw Phylogs that what I really needed there was a data logging tool. And to talk a little bit about sort of the internals of how that works, I'll, I'll start with uh, something. There's probably a lot of people here who have used Spark or some sort of similar EPL tool. And um, I, you've probably seen that there's two operations if you want to look at how many distinct values are in your data set you might have count distinct and then you might have approximate count distinct like, well what's the difference between two of them well one of them is a whole lot faster but let's talk about why the approximate is way faster if you're going to do a uh, count distinct as a classic i have map reduce you have to sort all that data and shuffle it over the network. So if I have 100 terabytes of data, that's 100 terabytes of data flowing over the network in order to do that distinct count. The approximate algorithm, uh, if you look under the hood, is a hyperlog blog, which is a fixed uh, uh, byte, uh, byte array. And what they're doing is they're just taking each value, hash and mod it to a particular slot. If it's a zero, make it a one, and then run that through your entire data set within your partition. And at the end, you know, some people smarter than me have done the math that you can look at how many bits have been flipped and, you know, come up with an estimate of how many unique values there are in that data set. And they can do that with like 99.5% accuracy. Um, and that doesn't require the network shuffle. And it's a fixed size data structure. So uh, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing a petabyte or a terabyte, it, the end statistical model that gives me the, an answer to a question is the same size of data. And so it ends up, lo and behold, that's just one of many, many statistical profiles. There's also other ones uh, that can do data distribution and frequent values. And uh, you start treading into that world and uh, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And it'd be really cool if somebody took all these 
uh, statistical data structures and put it into a library that I could just hook into my Spark job and just say, hey, run all my all the columns on my data set through all these statistical profiles and just gather that information for me and then give me a little visualizer. And that is what Ylogs is. And I started <laughs> seeing the, the potential of that. And that's um, why I'm, I'm, I'm really excited working here. I'm like, I, I'm starting to think about all, a lot of the old thing, like crazy pipeline engineering that I used to do because I didn't have a data logging solution. So that, that's my spiel. <laughs> Drew basically gave a short version of my talk. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Drew. This is great. Um, and now uh, I'd love to take it, tease it apart a little bit and, and talk about a few things that we specifically gather in this library. So, um, you know, if we wanted to design that kind of data log that Drew described, something very lightweight that plugs in and captures various statistics about your data. Um, what would be important to capture? Well, it turns out it's pretty straightforward. You'd want to capture metadata uh, about, you know, where where is this data coming from and how fresh is this data? You'd want to track various counts uh, to ensure that the volume of your data is healthy and that you don't have those so duplicates and surges in the counts or surges in missing values uh, to help SID. And then you want to track various uh, statistics to identify outliers and data quality bugs. And then you'd want to track distributions to you know, answer that distribution question, but also uh, if you need to identify data drifts and so on. And then you, know, you probably want to keep some small stratified sample of this raw data uh, to help you with debugging and post hoc analysis if you want to dive really deep. So these are kind of really table stakes of what you want to capture. And the spirit here is let's make this as simple as possible and as fast as possible. Because if we are talking logging, it has to be really straightforward to work with and shouldn't uh, require you to move massive volumes of data around, shouldn't require you to spin up any uh, specialized compute to process all of this. Uh, so really you want to design this logging solution with a few key properties um, and this is really inspiration from devops does really well uh, you want the logging solution to run in parallel with your main data workloads because you don't want to spin uh, a bunch of uh, other data processing pipelines to arrive at various statistics that you need to capture you want the logging to be very portable because you know whether you're using spark pipelines or kafka topics it shouldn't matter you should be able to capture this data um, this statistic, this log of the data. You want this to be configurable. Uh, of course, you know, uh, we're all data people. We all have opinions about what information we want to capture after all. So uh, configurable is really key. And then um, one of the key properties is you want this to be mergeable because if you have a distributed system and you're generating these log files from various instances, you do want to see, hey, what is my overall uh, data look like, or for example, if you are capturing these data log files on hourly basis and you want to roll things up into a day, you should be able to do that, uh, and so on. And finally, you want all of this to be close to, co to code, so you're not spinning up a bunch of infrastructure and you're doing it in uh, as little time and compute allocation resources as possible. So um, I guess moving on to the actual uh, implementation and to, to some of the actual ideas, we've uh, grappled with these issues and these ideas for quite a while. It turned out that you know uh, the YLabs team now is a bunch of people who came together because they have been wondering about how to solve this problem. And if you're, if you're wondering and really passionate about it, I guess this is my other opportunity to say that we're hiring. Um, so after a lot of years, I trying to figure out uh, what's missing and how to make all of these steps uh, really easy and answering all of those distribution questions and other data quality questions of Breeze, uh, we landed on uh, an open source library called Ylogs. If you follow that bit.ly link, it'll take you to the GitHub. Uh, Ylogs is a purpose-built data and ML logging library that we open sourced. Uh, it's builds to provide that lightweight, portable, configurable, mergeable, and all those 
good qualities data logs for both batch and streaming data workloads. Uh, and it's already making lives of a lot of people much, much easier. Um, I'll talk about a few use cases in a second, uh, but yeah, check it out. It's available in Python, Java, and Scala, and we're continuously expanding uh, the language support. And I guess Joe is going to a Go uh, conference, so we can support Go as well with the containerized deployment. We have actually a few customer teams that that use uh, that run in Go and use Ylogs. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what kind of further down what Ylogs offers. So the first thing that the first kind of frustrating property of data pipelines is that the data is ephemeral. If you're processing uh, large volumes of data, you're probably not persisting what data you're processing anywhere because it's really expensive. Uh, talking to a lot of teams, occasionally there's sampling that's happening, but uh, and then the sample of the data is stored somewhere for you know debugging and so on. Uh, but in many cases, nothing is persisted. So you can't really easily answer the question of what happened yesterday and, or what data distributions did I have yesterday, uh, unless you reproduce the entire thing or replay the entire thing. And we all know how easy it is to replay uh, these data systems and the ML systems, not easy at all. It's expensive, time consuming, and frankly, really tedious and uh, boring to spend your days doing. So Ylogs kind of introduces a very uh, simple idea of logging all of this key statistics uh, over intervals of time. So instead of reproducing the data, uh, you just go and load the log file and look at its content contents. Um, there are you know multiple open source libraries that exist today that, kind of tackle the problem of testing data quality or evaluating for data drift. There are some cool packages like DQ and great expectations. However, uh, with those solutions, you both capture the statistics and uh, make decisions about the statistics in one place. Um, and that's not ideal because you want to have a historic record of what happened with your data and then you want to build on top of that. So Ylogs uh, creates this kind of new way of thinking about your data. You no longer have ephemeral data pipelines and you no longer think of your data as one data set. You think of your data as snapshots uh, uh, of time and you can go easily, can go back you know, to the week ago, uh, to the week before now, a month before now, and understand what did your data look like at any given time and compare today to a week ago and uh, potentially um, use the data that you looked at a year ago uh, as the baseline or uh, extract constraints and create unit tests, but you, you want to have the flexibility of capturing the statistics and then deciding on what to do with the statistics later with your tools. And that's what Ylogs implements. It's been awfully quiet. So I'll pause to see if there are questions, reactions, feedback, is this crazy? What do you think? <laughs> Not all at once, everyone, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question. Um, yeah, so uh, so when you say the, uh, a standard format for, for representing a snapshot of data, is, uh, is, uh, is there something in mind with regards to, I, I understand you mentioned that um, because of the um, you know, nature of data being ephemeral, uh, you're capturing certain uh, aspects of the data and then you're loading those up to uh, to see what the data looked like at a at a point in time, uh, is there any notion of um, this data being uh, when you say standard format, like being interoperable with other kind of data measurement or metrics me measurement systems, like uh, time series systems uh, that that you know uh, enterprise customers commonly use? Uh, time series. So, are you saying can you take? Uh, can you now make a time series of this data and run anomaly detection uh, with any common anomaly detection algorithm? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I was just I was just wondering more like um, when you said standard format, do you mean standard format 
as in within y logs or like across like different systems that can plot time series data things like that uh so so let me take a step back and actually maybe i skip i skip a few slides to uh really answer your question so here's uh so out of the box y logs would uh, take the snapshot of data and persist it in a protobuf file uh because that's very lightweight and you can store knock yourself out storing a lot of them for a years uh if that's useful it, it crunches a bunch of statistics and uh as you can see here so uh this is an example of a partial um uh, output of y logs on wine quality data set because why not it's wednesday night uh and y logs captures all this key statistics like counts and distinct counts and summary statistics and so on and that's the default configuration and it does infer the schema so you don't need to configure kind of what's in the data frame you just point it to a data frame so now that you have this right suppose um oops what am i doing suppose you uh, let's say you want to figure out how your counts change or let's let's take your particular example with missing values right so you have missing values uh you're probably tracking some kind of missing it will be great to, to track the missing counts so you define what you're missing value is let's say you're counting nulls and you want to understand uh when is your system unhealthy with respect to missing values uh so you you capture the number of missing values uh, in your data snapshot on daily basis and you can extract that time series just of the null count very easily and say i want to have um I want to have an alert when this is within like two standard deviations or one standard deviation of what I, the the seven day average has been, and you could feed this into pretty much uh, anything, any algorithm that takes in the time series of data points. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I I think this this uh, this uh, chart or this uh, table really helped answer. So it it seems like this 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 is the format, and and you know based on different a varying range of querying and and visualization tools this could be you know plugged into that and and you know uh, uh you know visualize that way yes yes um and so the, it's stored in protobuf uh, for uh kind of efficiency sake but we have uh ways to convert it to csv and json right there in the library so you know once once you're in json or csv you can load it, load it in tableau uh or in any other data tool yes uh, I know there's Bernice and Chris here, uh, and Drew is still here. Anything, uh, I'm going to continue going through the talk, but uh, anything to add to specifically maybe Sid's question on, on taking this data and feeding it into anomaly detection? I, I could talk just briefly on the file format. Uh, the, so you have a protobuf that is pretty much just a container for multiple statistical models. And then if you were to dive into the internals of the uh, Ylogs library, you would probably find the Apache data sketches library. Uh, the implementations for those statistical models is open source and openly validated. And you'll actually find that uh, the data sketches uh, library gets used in a lot of uh, query tools. So you can actually take the hyperlog log uh, byte arrays and put them into various uh, query engines depending on what it, whether or not they use the data sketch uh, library. But I just wanted to say that yes, these uh, statistical models are stored in a pretty widely used format. Thank you, Drew. I, I see uh, Mikiko has a question. Want to jump in? Hey there. Um, yeah. So. Do you think later on in the talk you'll cover what um, like a prototypical sort of workflow looks like? Because right now, um, in terms of like testing data inputs, we're thinking about like two questions, um, just like on my team, on the MLNG team. The first one is uh, automate retraining of models. And then the second one is, um, you know, of course, like monitoring like data quality and all that um, <laughs> and enforcing good testing writing. Um, so uh, do you think it's uh, during this presentation you'll cover what a prototypical uh, workflow looks like when we combine Y logs with, for example, um, a library like Great Expectations um, and like sort of cloud providers like GCP? 
Yes, this is a fantastic question. I don't have an example of uh, how to pair up Y logs with great expectations, uh, mainly because uh, great expectation kind of combines the step of capturing statistics and alerting on the statistics together. Uh, what we do at Y Labs, and I'll give you actual like a very detailed blog post uh, to kind of walk through an idea is, let's say you're using GitHub and you want to have GitHub Actions uh, essentially act as unit tests for your data. Uh, so you can use Y logs to generate uh, constraints. Uh, and that's very similar to what Great Expectation also does. Uh, but in, in that case, you often are writing constraints by, your, uh, by yourself. You, you, you can use Y logs to generate a JSON file that describes the constraints of a healthy batch of data. Let's say you're in, ML, in an ML world. Uh, you know that the data that you trained your model on is healthy and clean, and that could be used as a baseline, right? So you can use that to uh, extract constraints, uh, to generate constraints, and then you would extract those constraints from uh, that JSON file and uh, use GitHub Actions to uh, act on them. So is that awesome. kind of close to what you were looking for? I shared a blog post with yeah, a fairly yeah. detailed approach. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think something we sort of struggle with is um, how do we <laughs> how do we scale data monitoring across a, a fleet of models instead of um, asking sort of uh, you know every project every model you know to uh, try to sort of recreate some tests. And so we're I think one question we're trying to figure out right is is just how do we like scale across? Um, and on the one hand, a lot of us engineers we can write tests with uh, great expectations per project, totally fine, but uh, you know, it would be nice to just have a higher level view of some of these things. So, um, yeah, I'll take a look at that blog post. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I will briefly talk about Y Labs, and that's precisely what we do at Y Labs. So, uh, we make it very straightforward to switch on monitoring for a model, uh, and the data that you're monitoring is generated through Y logs. So, all that statistics gets captured and then centralized, and we run anomaly detection for you. So you don't have to build any of those data pipe pipelines. Sweet. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Okay. Bernice. One sorry, just a quick comment that the slide uh, doesn't quite show is that like in addition to having the standard deviation for features, we also have lots of error bounds for many of these values. And that um, maybe as a, as, as a statistician and data scientist, it uh, can be really important uh, seeing the actual bounds for these estimates um, and something that a lot of different solutions may not have. So that's a great point, Bernice, thank you. So great to have a whole team here chipping in. <laughs> I have a question. Is it able to detect, um, I guess, distributions of non-normal data? Uh, distributions of not normal data, absolutely. Oh, non-normal, non yeah. Uh, so like, what, give me an example. Like not normally distributed. Oh, not normally I'm distributed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's like, what, it's like what, just what, abnormal data, weird data. I'm just what? kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Bernice, I see you're smiling. You want to you want to hop in? Yeah, I was say Gaussian is the word you need to use. Uh, <laughs> but Apparently. yeah, so, so we do. I mean, so so Ylogs stores, uh, Ylogs keeps track of this distribution and uh, is um, basically param. Oops. Okay. Oh no, we lost Bernice. Uh, oh. I think internet oh, connection. Internet. <laughs> okay, she will. She will jump in. Yes. Uh, y logs. Uh, can uh, Y logs does support uh, not normal, not Gaussian distributions. I see Andy also is here. Andy, do you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, I just dropped in the blog post about our our profiling techniques versus sampling. So the difference between profiling and sampling is that we try to approximate the, the distribution itself rather than just uh, using some prefix rule to sample the data. So you can capture even long tail events in this uh, because it's the stratified uh, kind of like um, 
profiling technique where we we actually use hash map based techniques to rebuild the distributions and get a much better accurate in terms of like uh, approximation of the uh, of the data. Thanks. Um, and I do have a slide on this as well. So let me uh, let me tell you a few more things that I think are interesting potentially for those groups. So. Um, we build Y logs with the idea that uh, if you do want to enable, um, if you do want to enable logging, you shouldn't have to do a ton of things. You should just, you know, be able to point it to the data that's relevant, and then magic happens. Um, so this is an example of what you would do with Spark, and we have a pretty deep Spark integration. Again, we're taking the wine quality data set and we're profiling each feature with Y logs. All of this is done, as you can see, in just a few lines. And behind the scenes, we use those data sketching algorithms that Drew mentioned from Apache Data Sketches library uh, to gather all these key statistics for, very, for each of the features. And uh, there's a very seamless integration with the data frame API. Uh, so we don't require any configuration. You don't have to specify the schema. You don't have to specify which features and so on. Uh, and then another cool thing about this particular integration is that uh, the Ylogs UDFs are implemented in Java. So you do get the full advantage of how amazingly fast Spark is. Uh, and we do uh, we uh, calculate all the statistics in just one pass over the data. So the performance of this is really, really awesome. It uh, runs wicked fast. And uh, you can run it in parallel with your main workloads. So this is for you know teams that are working with massive volumes of data. Bernice, you're back. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. My computer has been really weird. Same here. My laptop has been crashing all day today. I don't know what's happening. Uh, Drew, uh, we, we talked about the distributions that we're capturing. Um, and Andy jumped in because he is also very passionate about those distributions. <laughs> uh, Sid, one, one, uh, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably let Bernice uh, complete the, the portion of her answer that, that uh, you know, here, <laughs> yes. and, then, and then I'll ask. Okay, okay go, go for it. Bernice. Well, it looks like Danny actually answered in the chat. So thank you, Danny. Uh, yeah, what I was saying is uh, the, the methods that we're using underneath the hood in data sketches are pretty much all para non-parametric. So they don't make any assumptions about the distribution of the data that they collect. Hey, Danny, you're hey, a Ylogs expert already. <laughs> Maybe not that, but definitely Bayesian and non-parametric approaches to gathering data for sure. Uh, thanks for thanks for jumping in. Uh, Sid? Uh, yeah, I had uh, I had a couple of questions. So one on the um, uh, one on the uh, the Spark uh, example that you're showing right now. Um, so I see that uh, there's a profiling session, and then uh, there's there's a time uh, time column that we specify for uh, for the time aspect of the measurement. I believe. Um, I just wanted to uh, see if you can talk a little bit more about. Uh, how uh, I think you you briefly mentioned about the fact that there's a uh, you guys do one pass and this can run in parallel with the with the uh, the, the current workload. Um, just uh, wanted to understand a little bit more on how uh, uh, how how that works kind of in practice. Like, is it are you guys listening to the actual like data frame like executors? Um, and and when you say it it makes a single pass and that's but is that separate from the main workload pass and, and you know how is how does that work a little bit more? Yes, yeah. so I can answer. Sorry, go for it, Andy. <laughs> yeah, I can answer that from the angle of the Spark implementation. So this example uses the uh, aggregation operation. So it's not in the so if you do like data frame, it's actually uh, two operations here, but the, the, the data passing is a single pass. Another mode we are working on internally is called the accumulator mode, where you can hook Ylogs into the data frame stream as an, a Spark accumulator for those who know Spark. It's basically a watcher, like, a, like um, an agent that watches the data stream and it receives every single data point that passes through that uh that that call uh, that accumulator and then we basically accumulate while statistical information 
via that route. That route had uh, accumulated does not guarantee um, 100% accuracy. So that only works with that works for people who have really big data and only one approximation of the uh, of the data stream rather than people who want uh, super accurate statistics. But that's another mode that we're working on in uh, in terms of WAS and SPA. Got it. So, so if I understand this, then um, you are actually plugging into the the Spark processes to collect collect your metrics. Um, and the way this um, the way like so, if I imagine this as a pipeline, the the DF equals raw DF dot width column. Let's say that's your final data frame, and let's say that's being written to your final bucket. Let's say GCS or S3 or whatever Druid, some downstream system. Uh, the the val profiles equals df dot new profiling session is what is really uh, along with the the final like computation the action of the df being written um, it will kind of run in parallel with the with the executor processes while uh, with the main workload yeah that's a that's a correct way of understanding that and uh, and in fact that's the, we encourage people to in, in, to integrate in that manner because of uh, well when you're at when you're producing the data, that's when you want to capture these statistics, since you tend to have a massive cluster anyway. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah, no, I uh, appreciate that. Thank you for the detail there. Um, and, and the other question, and maybe this is uh, uh, coming in the next uh, uh, portion of the presentation, is the is that how, uh, how and if, if you guys do, how do you integrate with uh, closed source uh, query engines like BigQuery, Snowflake, um, and such, because we, uh, in our stack, we have pretty much everything like, you know, uh, Spark, BigQuery, Snowflake, Druid. So uh, like, uh, like, you know, how does this work with like some of those types of engines? So depend on the query engine, uh, for example, we tend to integrate either when the data is produced before entering this query engine system. So as a producer of, uh, of or, or the processor of the data stream, or another mode of integration is we are working with Snowflake to uh, to work with Snowpark. I don't know if you've heard the the name, yep. but it's the uh, is the offering where you can run uh, Java code, which is Wildox in yep. in Snowflake. Uh, and we're also working. We have integration already with uh, Databricks Data Delta Lake as well. Awesome. Yeah, I was I was kind of hoping you'd say Snowpark because Snowpark currently is in uh, is in like a, a preview a, a, a customer preview. Uh, feature for for Snowflake and and we are we are we just got that enabled on our account so uh, we're looking to see how to use that as well uh, yeah thank you yeah we're really excited about that yes we also have a, a preview that uh, we got our hands on and working on an integration I think it's going to be super exciting to uh, make it very easy to capture this data for uh, all of the snow snowpark users. And we should definitely brainstorm and share experiences. <laughs> now that now that you know how Ylogs works, I think it'll be great to get your feedback on the best way to integrate. Awesome. Okay, uh, let's move on. So I, I think this this might be already an overkill, but uh, just to give you an idea, again, we're talking about tracking statistics and batches. We talked about, I think, actually, I should have shown the slide when I was answering Sid's other question about time series. So uh, you let's say you have uh, 20 batches. Uh, and here I just ran, I used ML flow to generate this. This is still our wine quality. Uh, I ran uh, the model inference for 20 batches and used Ylogs to capture the data properties of every feature in the batch. And now you can visualize the distribution of, for example, the sulfur dioxide across the batches. And um, again, you can extract this data as a time series and then do uh, fun things uh, on kind of detecting distribution drifts and so on. Uh, I'll give a quick demo of Ylabs in a bit. Uh, we use uh, Hellinger distance internally to identify distribution drift. Uh, all right, uh, we talked a little bit about performance. Performance is super important uh, because performance is equal to cost effectiveness and you definitely don't want your logging solution to cost more than actually operating the data pipeline. Uh, so capturing the statistics again involves potentially moving massive amounts of data and because of data sketches, uh, we can do this remarkably quickly uh, with a constant memory footprint. Uh, and then another cool property is that the output is 
really lightweight uh, and configurable. So uh, in these benchmarks, uh, we're looking at, you know, 42 to 150 number of features, uh, pretty big data sets in some cases. And you can see that uh, A, the memory consumption is really lightweight. And then the outputs are really lightweight as well. The, their outputs are bound by the number of features. And another cool property, and I think there is already a blog post here that Andy shared is, uh, well, we discussed as far as distributions go. So a, a common approach that we hear is sampling data. So if you have really large data volume, you don't want to persist the entire uh, snapshot of data to then scan it and figure out distributions. So typically there is some kind of sample that gets collected and it's a small sample and it's typically not a stratified sample. And that tends to generate massive errors in this estimating this distribution. Uh, the data sketching techniques that uh, the data sketching technique uh, that we use for abnormal data <laughs> uh, creates a non-parametric uh, distribution. And uh, here are some benchmarks and the blog post that was shared earlier uh, shows a bunch of benchmarks that we've done to look at the errors that result from uh, capturing data with Y logs versus capturing uh, capturing distributions with Y logs versus capturing distributions from uh, a sample. All right. So again, going back to the idea and I skipped through the slide a little bit. Um, I think we touched on a few of these things really quickly. We build Y logs to make it really easy to track and test and monitor and debug and document data. Uh, we separated the concept of creating data statistics and persisting this data statistics and then acting upon it. Uh, so if you continuously log the data that runs through the pipeline, uh, let's say on daily basis or, or hourly basis, you can then layer um, things like writing unit tests with GitHub actions or doing monitoring or debugging or using the constraints to document what your data looked like at any given point in time. Uh, you can build out that functionality, but really the concept of logging the statistical properties is, is that fundamental piece that then enables a lot of other things. Um, all right. And then for those who you know are grappling with MLOps, um, really to sum it up, uh, Y logs enables various uh, ML operational activities. Uh, we have a bunch of integrations into uh, common data tools and pipelines. Uh, we talked quite a bit about the Spark integration uh, with Y logs. We also have a Python integration. So for those who you know, operate in Python environments. Uh, we make it really easy to capture this data and work with this data. And really systematically capturing these log files is what enables you to have visibility into data quality and data distributions and so on across your entire pipeline and ultimately unlocks all of those MLOps activities that are currently the talk of the town, I believe. Yeah, um, I will pause here. I know, uh, I guess a, a really nice, segue into uh, what can be done with Ylogs is to show maybe a super quick demo uh, of what we do at Ylabs. And if you want to follow along uh, in demo, we uh, have a sandbox uh, of an AI observability platform. So what we do, uh, if you go to ylabs.ai and click on this little try live sandbox button and log in with your Google credentials uh, with your yeah, Google credentials or LinkedIn on, or uh, GitHub, you will land on this little sandbox that has a bunch of models running. And what we do is we collect data with Y logs, and then we centralize that those statistical profiles and we run anomaly detection on them. So if we dive here, this is um, a month worth of data. If we dive, dive here into uh, the Lending Club credit model, you could get a sense of what that looks like. Um, this is 
synthetic data beautifully created by Bernice here. Uh, Landing Club data is not as messy as this, but we make it exciting uh, with uh, some injections of synthetic failures. So to give you an idea, I think null fractions was uh, missing values was one thing that uh, came up explicitly. So imagine uh, you, you have this Landing Club model. Uh, it has 103 features and you uh, want to track you want to make sure that whenever there's a surge in missing values, you get an alert. Uh, so if you enable Y labs on your model uh, inputs and potentially model outputs, but specifically on model inputs, if we recognize uh, that there has been uh, a surge in missing values, and this was this is a really small surge in missing values, but nevertheless, um, we will send you an alert. Or if we recognize that there was an increase in the cardinality, we'll send you an alert uh, and so on. So this really makes it uh, straightforward to enable monitoring. Uh, all we capture is uh, the data that gets generated with Y logs with those statistical profiles. And then we run anomaly detection on it to recognize when things deviated from what you consider a baseline. And uh, you can use various kinds of baselines. For example, you can run Y logs on, on the healthy batch of data they used for training the model, and that would be considered a baseline will alert when there are deviations from that, or you can uh, configure a baseline that tracks the last seven days of data and then alert when uh, there is a deviation from that running average. I'll pause here to see if there are questions again, reactions. Maybe thoughts from the Y Labs team on something I missed. <laughs> Chris, I, 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 I just think, think that's you're, pr you're pr pretty practiced at this talk by now. <laughs> <laughs> I have given this talk, well, versions of this talk a few times. I think my favorite part of this UI is that it doesn't require sending any raw data to the cloud. Yes, and that's, uh, I think, ultimately is, is key for data systems because uh, data tends to be very sensitive, proprietary, uh, captures all kinds of things that the company does not want to share out. And uh, the approach that we've taken with Ylogs is intentionally not capturing uh, any of the raw data, it captures only statistical properties of the data, which is really all you need uh, to recognize data quality issues and data drifts. Yeah, it seems pretty innocuous and, and secure. So even a healthcare company could use it. Yes, um, we do have a healthcare company that's using it. <laughs> so yeah, I, I will open up for questions, but before that, I one of the reasons, what, so, so Chris commented at how uh, polished this talk is. Uh, the reason why I'm giving this talk is because I believe we do need to have a standard for data logging. I believe that every uh, single data application should uh, by default have a concept of logging the statistical properties of this data because it really enables basic things, uh, basic hygiene of a, of a good robust system. Uh, so I would love to uh, have people in this room come in and help us think through the standard for data logging. Uh, Ylogs is an open source library. Uh, the most basic way you can help is to give us stars. So we uh, help spread the word uh, and then absolutely give us feedback and uh, contribute. We'd love to get your help on extending this library to more data types. And uh, we already have versions uh, and kind of various statistics that we capture for uh, images and text and audio. And you can go in all kinds of interesting directions as far as gathering statistics from uh, complex data and then uh, contribute integrations. So we have a bunch of integrations that we've built out. We're constantly adding new integrations and would love the community to contribute uh, or to even give us requests of what integrations would be valuable to build. Uh, really, we're trying to uh, make this available to every data practitioner and design it 
uh, together with the awesome data practitioners like the ones that are in this call today. I'll stop talking and say thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Alyssa. It's been awesome. What questions do you have for? Yeah, I can do one more question. Um, um, so the um, I think the last slide uh, that uh, before the demo um, that you showed, which had a bunch of uh, stuff that you were uh, kind of uh, on the right. Yeah, after this one, uh, another one after this. Uh, the the way you kind of go into all these data drift uh, monitors and model performance monitors uh, and such. Uh, <clears throat> one of the problems that I've been looking to solve uh, in my kind of role is um, is to create um, some some type of versioning uh, of what uh, what version of the pipeline code uh produce so like we use scala and so we have a you know a, a, a pr or so that goes in every couple of days and, and different various members from our team outside our team uh who manage the data dashboards uh you know contribute to this repo and so the notion of uh, what version of code produced a certain version of the data uh, for that pipeline um, say i were to integrate um, y logs uh into one of these pipelines um, how, uh, what, what thoughts would you have in terms of uh, maybe producing an extra column in, in, in the data or, or some type of, uh, um, you know, value uh, in the data that, that, you know, we could directly reference and, and cross-reference with the, uh, with the Y logs, um, uh, uh, you know, temporal kind of uh, output for that point in time and, and make it faster for us to kind of see, okay, which, which version of the code produces this. Yes, I can answer that. Go for it, Andy. Yeah, so this is something I loved when uh, I discovered it in the DevOps world, the concept of tagging. Mm -hmm. So you tag key value pairs in on, on your metric data points so they get organized correctly in the back end so they know how to aggregate it. Similar concept in wire logs. So you, you can use tagging not only for aggregation but also for traceability as in it's just simply a dictionary in in the, in, in the data structure. So you can put in arbitrary key value pairs, including things like Git commit or even the link to the GitHub repo that you, or your GitHub repo with the right commit. And that's one way I, I would encourage people to think about data observability is in, integrating with existing uh, DevOps CI CD tooling as well. And this is the perfect use case for this. As in, whenever you commit, you can even run unit tests possibly tag the output of that unit test with the new profile. And then when you deploy and the code generate new profile, then you tag it again with the, uh, with the commit tag and that should flow throughout the system, through the system. Awesome, thank you. And Sid, if you're experimenting, join the Slack channel. Uh, that's where a lot of people from YLabs hang out and we have a bunch of groups that are adopting YLogs and building on top of YLogs. Uh, so join in, let's brainstorm, and would love to uh, see how we can solve the problem that you're trying to solve with Unity. For sure, yeah, definitely join that, join that shortly. Awesome, and uh, everybody is welcome. We are very eager to get your feedback and potentially contributions. Let's figure out a way to collaborate. I think uh, this is good cause enabling. We talk a lot about, you know, robust, responsible, transparent, out of, um, accountable AI and, and data practice. This is a very actionable thing to do. So would love everybody's feedback on Slack, on email, on Twitter, uh, and your contributions and your stars and your love. Uh, everybody's laughing at this point. I'm really, really, really enjoying myself talking on the Wednesday night. <laughs> Uh, we are too. So. so, so I have a question <laughs> on the um, on the sandbox. Can you use if I have my own data? Can I put it in there, or do I just have to use what's the data sets that you already have in there? Uh, on the sandbox, yes, but uh, we are launching a self serve version of the platform, uh, and I would love to uh, give you early access. Uh, 
send me an email. So is it is it open source then for? Uh, so yeah. the open the the Y logs the way we capture data is with the open source. Uh, the platform is not open source, but it is open for you to use. So we'd love to give you access. Okay. Thanks. I have a question. Um, it's pertaining to data lineage. Is there any notion of extending uh, the work you're doing, or any thoughts about like data quality or observability in general with respect to uh, um, data lineage? Yeah, I think one of the approaches is what it was and what Andy described. And I don't know, Andy, do you want to jump in? Uh, I know you have lots of opinions about data lineage. So again, shameless. Uh, quite, quite cool. I, I love the phrase of uh, "do not reinvent the wheel." A shameless uh, kind of copying of a previous great idea is the concept of uh, DevOps tracing, and I would love to. Uh, so what we're working on is figuring out how to make it really easy to plug in the concept tracer of tracing ID into Wildlock. I mean, Wildlock supports it now, but we want to make it work with things like MLflow where uh, concept of IDs are more, make more sense. So it's really dependent uh, on the data system. But yes, that's one way we think about lineage is to have this traceability, uh, tracing ID across uh, Wildlock profiles. And you can imagine building a very similar visualization, but from the data perspective, uh, to what they have, what we have, we have in the DevOps world of request tracing or post service level tracing. That's awesome. Thanks. Sweet. If anybody has a use case like that, let's talk. We'd love to uh, build it for a specific use case and make it work. Joe, you probably do have use cases we should talk about. Yeah, we think we should. <laughs> awesome. Any more questions? So, so I had another question. Uh, so on your um, table that you had that has like the descriptions or the statistics that you had on there and there's like a, there's like a column called quantile zero and then quantile one between that there's an ellipse is that like giving you your like quartiles or does it give you all hundred percent i guess this is kind of a question well let me go back to this um and while i'm going back bernice i know you probably would want to jump in on this sure yeah so it's somewhere in between uh right now we have in there, um, the like the quartiles as well as kind of 95%, 99%, 1%, uh, so on. The things that we thought were useful uh, there. Um, and it's open source, so it, it's very easy if you wanted to add uh, kind of whichever other, other quantiles that you'd want. Yeah, it seems like if you, um, you know, like that, what's it called? Quantile transform in, in uh, scikit-learn, they have, the ability to map the, you know, so if it's a not like a non-Gaussian, like you're talking about, it, it makes it so you could map that to two quantiles. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there's something similar going happening underneath the hood. We're kind of collecting a large uh, distribution of this whole thing, and then using kind of a similar transform to find all of those quantiles. Thanks, John. And yes, please give us feedback. Uh, you can open issues. We So I guess one thing that I didn't point out is there's a Python version of Ylogs and, and the Java version of Ylogs. Uh, the Java one is the one that has Spark uh, integration and the Python one uh, is the the one that I linked the most. So uh, if there are any feature requests, please uh, open them up. Love to. To, uh, to clarify. We also have PySpark integration, which means if you run Python and Spark, you can still access Ylog. So we still love Python people. <laughs> Andy's biased towards Spark, uh, but he still loves Python people. This is a Python crowd. So thanks, Andy. <laughs> I know. We love you. We love you too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thanks. This has been an awesome presentation. Uh, great feedback from the audience. Good questions. Um,
check out Y Logs, Y Labs. Um, and thanks, Alyssa, Andy, and, and the whole uh, Y Labs crew. It's been a great talk. So, round of applause, everybody. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quiet it really applause. By now, Zoom have uh, should have already built in like an audio feature of like you know the host clicks a button and there's like applause. I it really to should. It so it's, many times. It's pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll uh, hit uh, start recording right now, and then we can uh, 